welcome to the broadcast, and I try to delete my excessive audio clips and just bring, I got two clips now, and it's interference when I even touch the volume, the, all of a sudden it breaks up horribly, at least in my earpiece anyway, so I need to go back and listen to that and find out what's, just bring it down to one audio clip and there's nothing left, because there's still interference, so I've eliminated everything else. <clears throat> okay, this is Patrick Penry. You know me also as Tony Muga, and I'm a former alternative media writer. And now I'm doing some blog talk and some videos on YouTube, and I have a WordPress blog. And what I'm trying to focus on these days are the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Freedom of Information documents, which specifically pertain to Fukushima. So those would be ones that would come chronologically after March 11th of 2011. And there's plenty of them to go through. And before I dig back into the 507-page document and finish the first 100 pages that I, I missed last time, I want to briefly read you a piece from an article. I followed this through e News to an article from a newspaper. Let's see, New Jersey, Newsroom Jersey, NewJerseyNewsroom.com. Okay, and this is about the Sandy Hurricane and Oyster Creek, which as we all know, if you've been paying attention, or if you don't know, you need to know, <clears throat> there was a steam discharge there. But let me read you the segment. It says, Sandy pushed water levels in the Delaware River to 98 feet, and the winds created additional waves approximately 12 feet high. The high waves in the river swamped four of Salem's six massive pumps in a building along the river's edge, which pull in the water through a 40-foot wide conduit. The loss of these pumps caused a chain reaction of events, leading to a shutdown of Salem 1 and a massive steam dump into the atmosphere. Officials later said the steam had little or no detectable radiation. Well, I don't doubt they said that, folks, because it's always little or no detectable radiation, or, or they check for iodine or cesium and they'll We'll wait a couple of weeks for the half-life to, you know, for it to decrease in intensity. But to note, our plants are not invulnerable. Okay, they have an Achilles heel, and what is that? Well, we're on planet Earth, and geologically, it's an unstable planet. Not like the Death Star. If the Death Star were orbiting the sun, at least you wouldn't have earthquakes. You wouldn't have storms and tornadoes and that kind of thing. You don't have terrorists necessarily, but we have all these different factors that play into the the danger uh, factor of the nuclear power industry. And I'm real quick going to lead you, read you a list. This is this is dated. I don't deny that it's from the late '70s review of the NRC of these Mark One containments, but it it lists at least at that time the number the ones that were up and running and a couple that they were had in the process of building. So I want you to know where these Mark One containment systems are because these are the ones that are problematic. When you study the Mark I containment system, my understanding is that it's kind of like cutting corners and trying to build it small and conserve um, the resources and parts and labor to build it. Well, in the end, you have to have a, a device, if you will, to to hold excess pressure and steam. If the, in any event you need to release steam, they're required to have something to hopefully take it in the condensers, cool it down, and it stores it and holds the, the overpressurization. But what they found when they were, got to the Mark III containment system and were designing and building those, this is my understanding anyway, that they their calculations then, they looked back on the Mark I and said, hey, we should have made different calculations or should have looked at it differently knowing what we know now. Let's go back and have a look and see uh, what the problem is. And sure enough, if, and historically, if you look, people were pointing out early, one, hey, this, early on there's a problem with the Mark I. You really don't want to produce anymore. They had already sold it and already been placed and they were up and running so they're so they, they look at it and try and decide what they can do. Well NRC really just issues recommendations and I don't know to what extent they have or have not taken action to assure in the event you have to release this steam that there's something there that will that will hold the steam. And then my question that immediately came to my mind is if you build a like a, a, a some kind of container and condensers to cool it and suck it into this container and store it. Well, then where does that go eventually? Because it doesn't. Do you scrub it somehow? Or do you? How much can you clean it? It doesn't go into another dimension. It doesn't go into a 
some kind of portal to another world. So if the radiation doesn't make it go away. It would still be in that container is my logic and way of thinking. So it seems to me there's really no safe way. There's really no safe way. You're never going to have a safe reactor, no matter how much they technolo technology they can build one that's safer, but will never be completely safe. Now, they'll tell you differently, though, but, I'm, but if you look at it historically and if you just think geologically, it's just a matter of time before there would be an event, uh, an earthquake of such magnitude that they, they can't account for. Or it could be like someone suggested a blizzard would be happening, and then there would be an earthquake, a huge earthquake, and that would hamper. You'd have two things at once at unforeseen you know, circumstances. So here's the list of domestic gold water reactor facilities with Mark I containment system. Brown's Ferry Units 1, 2, and 3. That's the Tennessee Valley Authority is the licensee. Brunswick Units 1 and 2. That's Carolina Power and Light. At least in the late 70s, that too was the owner. They're the stakeholder, whatever you want to call them. The documents, the FOIA documents are called stakeholders. Cooper Station, Nebraska Public Power District. Dresden Units 2 and 3. Commonwealth Edison Company. Dwayne Arnold, Iowa Electric Light and Power. Fitzpatrick, Power Authority State of New York. Lots going on with Fitzpatrick, too, these days. Hatch Units 1 and 2, Georgia Power Company. Millstone Unit 1, Northeast Nuclear Energy Company. Monticello, Northern States Power Company. Nine Mile Point Unit 1. Niagara Mohawk Power Corporation, we all know that one recently with Sandy, involved with Sandy. And the next one, Oyster Creek, Jersey Central Power and Light, that one also affected by Sandy. Peach Bottom Units 2 and 3, Philadelphia Electric Company. See how nice that sounds? Peach Bottom. Sounds like you're going to get a slice of cobbler and a cold glass of milk with that one, folks. Pilgrim Unit 1, Boston Edison Company. Quad Cities Units 1 and 2, Commonwealth Edison Company. Vermont Yankee, Yankee Atomic Electric Company. And then it says plants under construction and the applicant, and this is like what's going on in Levy County right now, which I've just got information. It's actually on a fault line, and my mom already knew about that. So wouldn't you know, it's not only just the ecological water problem there, but now it's on a fault line too. And it all comes out if you really investigate and dig deep enough. So under construction at the time, again, this was 70, late 70s, Fermi Unit 2, the Detroit Edison Company, and Hope Creek Units 1 and 2, Public Service Electric and Gas. I'm not exactly certain where all of these are, but you can you get the idea that it's not just one or two. There's 15 plus. And, and they're not all identical to the Fukushima design, although some are very similar. My understanding is there are little variations. But the Oyster Creek, if I'm not mistaken, according to a number of sources I've read, is an identical design to Fukushima, only it holds a lot more fuel there. So you look at Oyster Creek and Sandy, I mean, we dodged a bullet. We dodged a bullet on that one. And I will be, I'm still preparing for my weaponized weather special I'm going to talk about, because we do need to really talk about this, right? Okay, now, I wanted to bring you up to speed on that and that little news article. And then I want to go back to the documents, and we want to read from the documents. And I'm going to give you more on the Mark I containment. I'm reading a analysis uh, by NRC of the Mark I containment. It really goes into detail on what the real problem is. It's, it's not such a technical language or jargon that I can't understand it. So I, I'll be able to give you simplified layman's terms about what really the problem is. I kind of did earlier. It's all about containment of the you know, pressurized gases and, and whatever escapes during a, you know, close to, you're trying to prevent the criticality is what it's all about. And you're, you would open your steam valve and, and it would flow into a condenser, a chamber that would hopefully contain it and keep it from being released into the atmosphere. And at the same time, maybe you make corrections and adjustments to bring the uh, temperature inside the uh, main containment back down to an acceptable level. And that's the basic premise of that. Let me open my document. Okay, this is from page 51. When I, when I post these up on Uncovering Plumegate on the WordPress blog, 
I will give you a page number on the description, and that's the page number that when you open the Freedom of Information file, at the top of that you'll see a little box that gives you that you can type in a page number and go to it, or it'll tell you what page you're on and the number of pages on the document. And so if you go by the number that's the first number I give, page 51, for example, that's when you can type in that little box and hit return, and it will take you right to that page. And while I'm adding can I add to that to people who are doing the research into these documents? Uh, keep in mind there's a box up there as well. You can type a search word in, and it will actually go through the document by that word and bring you to each page of that word, which is extremely helpful if you're looking for like White House to see White House involvement or DITRA to see that DITRA runs or NARAC. You can easily zip through that, that particular document and locate what you need to find. So, And I invite everyone. It's easy to do. I'm posting up a um, acronym uh, uh, page and a definitions page. So if you don't know what some of these these acronyms mean or you're not certain what a NARAC is or DITRA, I'm going to have an explanation there and as, as close to layman's terms as I can. Not that I'm an expert myself, but I want people to be able to digest and understand what's being, what the term is. Okay, this is from page 51. And this is from the 507 page a document I put the NRC work order 944 I think is what it was children's doses to thyroid to kids in California is what I refer to this one as Mr. Castro says yeah the nuclear science of this is not you know it's just get water on it you know we are there's some debate about lead and you know we've got all kinds of suggestions from industry people non-nuclear industry people here in Japan big corporations are giving us advice and you know dump Nothing but boron on the core, the spent fuel pools, and you know a lot of people have got a lot of ideas. That one I included in there because it, again I've got a file that's, that's titled just how bad it was, and I want people to know that when you have these major criticalities and meltdown, of course they'll downplay it. They always do, but the the reality is it can be quite serious, so serious that workers will refuse to even go in and do anything. And maybe for the first 24 hours, you can't go in. Conditions or the, the logistics of it, the physicality, there's rubble blocking the, and that was the case with Fukushima, certainly. It wasn't just high rims. It was rubble blocking the path to get in. The tsunami pushed stuff around. The earthquake, things collapsed all over the place. The explosions from the, the units, from the, well, it's like three or four units, one, two, and three all had stuff blown out and damaged to it. Three was the worst of them all, and number four was pretty bad as well. So all that leaves a lot of debris. There's high rims. There's particles from spent fuel all over the place. So it's a real mess. It's not what they want you to believe. And three mile, no doubt about it, that was you know not as a severe, a partial melt or whatever they want to call it. But either way, it's the public that loses each time. The general public always is a loser when we have these events and criticalities. OK, it goes on to say, but you can only do what you can do. This is um, Mr. Castro, I believe Chuck Castro. But you can only do what you can do. So we're also you know, trying to figure out how to drop the dose rate so that you know people can install pumping systems or whatever strategy we have. So you know we are really trying to work that out and trying to decide whether you know to put lead in there or to put you know sand or to get the dose rates down. The big question, you know, you really don't want to put anything around the fuel so you can keep it cool. But what's left of it or whatever is there, keep it coolable, but you've got to get the dose rates down. That's kind of the challenge now. You know, we're thinking Humvees for workers, you know, to transit in there to pipe and some shielding, some mechanism to shield the workers. But some of these, you know, these are lethal dose rates. They're getting outside the building. Male participant, yeah. So lethal dose rates outside the building. Please keep in mind, and, and while I'm thinking about it, go to the Nuclear Information Resource Service, NIRS. They have a website. Type in MOX for MOX fuel and go in and read the page on MOX fuel. And, and more than that, just Google MOX fuel and start looking around, keeping in mind that certain outlets are influenced by the people who are profiting from the industry. So if you go to certain websites, of course, it's going to look very favorable upon MOX fuel. But I've already showed where the 
you know, one place will say a favorable assessment of mock feudal, but then I go in and I show you the mess here with Fukushima, and there's plenty of other evidence to to counter that. So keep that in mind when you do Google and search. There's a very heavy influence in the nuclear industry with the trolls and the shills and the apologists. They're, they're paid well to convince you that it's clean energy. That's like Romney. It's paid well to be up on stage during the debates and yammer on about nuclear being clean energy. And that's just total uh, a total farce. And that's social programming because the sheep will believe it and they hear that and you know, then you're talking to your aunt or your uncle and she's telling you about how awesome the nuclear plant is and you, you know, good luck trying to get through to them sometime. Okay, Mr. Castro, he goes on to say, so you know, if there's some shielding mechanism, oh, wait a minute, did I read that one? Nope. Shielding mechanism, you can get people in there or pre-modularize the pipes and climb in with an unmanned UAV to, you know, and then go in and bolt it up, whatever. So I think that's, you know, we're working with U.S. forces Japan working with DOD. So basically what I'm saying is that, you know, this is more of a this is more of a mechanical engineering and logistic issue at this point. Male participant. So Army Corps of Engineer type project as opposed to nuclear science, Mr. Castro. That's at least my, you know, perspective. Male participant. What I was going to say is have we have they made the decision to go with go with the pumping in the water Vice going with sand or boron or, you know, male participant Clay or Mr. Castro. They are only, they have one strategy, helicopters with the dropping water and riot cannons. No easy fix there, folks. And as you can see when they're talking about the lethal dose rates, workers don't want to go in. To be able to stabilize the situation, you have to access the situation. Remember like on Karate Kid, he said, if he can't breathe, he can't fight. Same kind of thing. If he can't see, he can't fight. This is the same deal. You can't get to the, the, the reactor site. You can't inject boron. You can't spray with water cannons or whatever your, your scheme is going to be. And I say they're all schemes because none of it's 100% perfect. doesn't stop the radiation instantly and doesn't pull the plume back and suck it back inside. Not at all. And I've posted up a nice screen capture of some of their modeling of the plume headed right across the Pacific at us. So do the math with the fatality counts and the cancer that we're beginning to hear about now. I'm actually beginning to hear stories, and, I, and I've heard a lot about these plant mutations that have been going on, and that's kind of been suppressed, too. They don't want you to know that plants will pick up certain radioactive substances. Some they won't, but if you put calcium down, it will absorb calcium instead of uh, radioactive uh, maybe cadmium, if I'm not mistaken. Don't quote me on that. But if you put a certain thing down with your plant, it won't absorb something else. Uh, that's kind of being suppressed as well. Okay, male participant. The media reporting. The media reporting shows the water drops occurring on Unit 3. Is that your understanding? Again, major concern about Unit 3. What's the difference between Unit 3 and the others? Well, Unit 3 is the MOX fuel reactor. Now, there's a lot of talk of Unit 4 in the documents, and they are also very concerned about Unit 4. But initially, they're, they're more concerned about 3. And when I, I read this little pamphlet my mom gave me from FukushimaResponse.org, it's actually a printed pamphlet, it says on one of its pointers here, it says, number one, the cores of reactors number 1, 2, and 3 at Fukushima have already melted down. So... A lot of times I don't like to talk about what's melted and what happened to fuel pools because, again, I'm sifting through documents. I'm trying to find out myself and get a lead on what's really real and what they knew early on. That's the whole point. But we can certainly see now that there were multiple melts, one, two, and three. And I can tell you now that the number four, there's quite a lot of talk about this drone flyover of Japan's where the NRC guys are scratching their heads and saying, yeah, the Japanese say that they see a little reflection down inside number four spent fuel pool, and that means there's a little bit of water still left in there. And, then, and the NRC guys are back and forth telling each other, no, I don't see that. I don't see that either. You know, that's a, a very favorable, extra favorable assessment. And as we now know with TEPCO, they're proven liars so many times, so many times. I mean, again, how many chances do they get? Okay, Mr. Castro. The guy says there's water drops on Unit 3. Is that your understanding, Mr. Castro? Yes, that's their priority is Unit 3, male participant. And why? I guess when we came off this morning, John was on his way over to talk to NISA and TEPCO, 
and the reporting was there was no water in Unit 4. And that was the one that was on the top of our list in Audible, putting three on the top of their list. And then I guess the other question, when you guys updated our two-pager and sent it back, you did not touch the one that said that Unit 4's pool was likely dry. Is that still your understanding? And what is driving in their mind three to be a priority versus two? So clearly in that you can see that you can see some of the reality of unit four, the spent fuel pool likely dry. How long is it dry before we've got emanations pouring off of it? And one, two, and three have melted down. They're worried about two. They're worried about three. I mean, this is really revealing into the seriousness of the situation. And, and please don't think that American plants are immune from this. It's absolutely not the case that the, the nuclear activists and I'm just joining the scene recently. I haven't been writing about this, but since February of this year, they've rightfully been right all along to be very upset and to be totally against the nuclear industry. And I don't deny, I mean, as a kid, I was my dad taught nuclear physics at the University of Florida, and because of that, that I had a place to live and food and clothes and um, was able to even get a limited education at Santa Fe College. So... I don't deny that in some ironic sense, nuclear power would helped raise me and get me to this point. But looking back at it, wouldn't it have been better if they had just released the Tesla technology and the suppressed solar panel and all this other 5,000 patents? I mean, the monopoly situation has been going on a long time. So it never needed to be this way except to make weapons and to have a power monopoly. And I always stress that. Make sure people understand the the big picture of things. There's a reason for everything. And I tell you, I find out these days the nuclear industry has got its tentacles far and wide. Okay, we're looking at, I've titled this one, let's see, NARAC. Okay, now we're going to look into NARAC, which I, you know, when you read the documents at first, you don't have a clue what it is, but then they'll talk about modeling and NARAC's going to do modeling. So then you know it's some group of people who are modeling plumes and modeling emanations from, it doesn't have to be a melt, a lot of these companies do like from smokestacks or brush fires or whatever, they can model plumes and smoke and that kind of stuff. It's using the same kind of software if you think about it that way. So this is a series of captures where we will talk about NARAC, N-A-R-A-C, and you'll get to learn a little bit about NARAC. Can you grab a sip of water one moment? All right. We're going to get the data from NARAC in Audible. I don't know if that gets into any of the another male participant. The data from NARAC, you're in Audible when? They have a 1 a.m. conference call to talk about when we're going to use an Audible. Male participant, okay. Another male participant. I will note that they never got, remember last night we were talking about the data from an Audible? It went out before they had permission. Male participant, yeah. Another male participant. NARAC never gave that to us, so communication was inaudible. They are having this 1 o'clock call. Male participants. So NARAC, NARAC is where? Are they in Las Vegas? Male participant. F-R-M-A-C, phonetic sound, FERMAC. And I think the MAC, when you look at the M-A-C, these are guys that are modeling the worst case scenario is my understanding. I'm not, and it may be a long um, abbreviation FRMAC, but I see it reference as MAC to the MAC codes, and that's my understanding is that's the more serious modeling of the plume and, and fallout. Um, and it's an, an audible st stuff, I just have to pass through it. Male participant, well, out in California, yes. Male participant, inaudible. Male participant, right, so how do male participant, well, so the 1 o'clock call is about there for them, male participant. The 1 o'clock call, I really don't know. Another male participant. No, 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 no. The 1 o'clock call, male participant, inaudible. Going to get the data for inaudible, male participant. Is to ask what's going on with the inaudible. When are we going to get the data, inaudible, male participant, inaudible. Five hours ago. They're waiting for it. It's late. Five hours ago, he's, he's, he's getting Male participant, yeah. No, that's a good, so I mean, yeah, I mean that male participant. They did tell us they were going to analyze it before they gave it to us, another male participant. For how long? 
male participant. That they didn't tell us. So in Audible, quite a bit. They haven't been very close in Audible, another male participant. So what about the four in Audible? Are we doing, are we getting any more from them? Male participant. I, yeah, that is going to be our version of, that is going to be this extension of the inaudible. We did ask for their assumptions in Audible. I don't think we've gotten it. It's for them to decide in Audible in the course of a year from an Audible. So in other words, eating, drinking, a one-year-old drinking from, again, this is, there's references to somebody's modeling where they're saying it would be a kid who's drinking milk from a cow, eating out of the same field for the year. In other words, you're not buying from a grocery store that's coming from here or coming from there. You live on a dairy farm. The CCNs landed on the grass. The cows eat it and you drink that milk consistently for a year. And while granted that is the worst case scenario, all their estimates were downplayed, and we now know that's absolutely not the case. And as we'll see, the future will play out when we look at cancer mortality rates. Not to get distracted, but I did look today because I know people now who are saying that there are effects showing up now cancer-wise from Fukushima in the States. And so I, I do a look to see if anyone's done any studies since March of 11 who's been taking statistics and recording and where can I access that information, right? You would think at the end of every year someone goes in and posts that kind of, collects it and posts that information. If all these hospitals have computers and it's all, you know, you can't tell. If they come and serve you a warrant, they know exactly how to find you on the computer. You know what I'm saying? So they, they should be able to access that information, post up at the end of the year, well, Contraire, mon frere, my uh, search led me to on you know, a dead end. The closest I can find is like up to 2008, maybe 2009. But even studies published in 2011 are referring back to 2008, 2004, and prior years. At least my initial dig into it, it uh, right off the bat, I'm like, look, it's not going to be easy, and is anyone even doing it? Is anyone even doing it? I know we're building fantastic machines of death and bombs to explode and prepping to build new nuclear plants, but maybe we need to spend money somewhere else, right? Somewhere else. Male participant that had iodine in it. Another male participant. All right, that's a little bit different. Male participant, inaudible. Male participant. It's a farmer scenario, I'm sure, where they're drinking the same cow's milk, that kind of male participant. And we don't know how the inaudible to get that multiple inaudible speakers. Mr. Castro, the reason it would be the priority is because it, it was, now it's not steaming at all. It was a priority because it was steaming heavily. They knew they were losing water level in it because it was steaming heavily. So they wanted to get to that one, and they believed through their helicopter flight and their vague, you know, nondescript images that there was water in Unit 4. Again, this is telling on TEPCO, our guys aren't totally to blame because let's be honest, TEPCO's, and, and I'm sure TEPCO's pressured. Even if TEPCO wanted to tell the truth, the whole industry is what's behind pressuring these people to downplay and do damage mitigation. Right? It's a systemic-wide corruption. It's a systemic-wide negative system. It's a totally negative. I'm sure the cancer industry is not complaining about it at all. They're going to bleed people's money dry, and then people are going to die from cancer. Uh, that's what will play out in the coming years. That's what my studies have led me to believe. Anyway, I hope it doesn't. I hope I'm wrong. I really, really do. Male participant, yeah, they believe they're, they didn't say it's covered, but they believe there's a decent amount of water in Unit 4. The highest priority for them is Unit 3 right now. Mr. Castro, we've looked, and our best estimate, who knows who is right, you know, it could be partially whatever. I mean, you know, we don't know, and our best guess, our best estimate after looking at the imaging at 7.30 this morning is there is no Unit 4 spent fuel pool. Male participant, right. Mr. Castro, you know, that's our best, from the close-up images that we have seen, our best, I mean, you can't fathom that there is a spent fuel pool if you see the amount of damage to that building. Male participant, right. So we, Mr. Castro, you can't fathom that there would be a spent fuel pool in there. I mean, that building is, is structurally, you know, is damaged severely. And to think that there's a spent fuel pool in there, we think it's likely because it was steaming some and it stopped steaming. So to us, that meant that it wasn't, you know, that it had dried out. And, you know, so, and it could be that its fuel is all over the building. 
you know, that is was part of the explosion, and they basically spread that fuel, spent fuel all over the inside of that building. No participant. We were seeing similar images of the building when you guys were going off to talk to NISA and TEPCO, you know, 20 hours ago. When you came back from that, was that when, was it at that meeting that you guys saw their images that they thought showed water in the pool? Mr. Castro. Well, they took an image at 5 o'clock yesterday, which was almost 24 hours ago. It was 22 hours ago they took that image, that video from a helicopter. They didn't show it to us until 10 o'clock this morning. Mr. Castro, almost 12 hours later, they showed it to us, and, you know, we looked at the video, and we can't, you know, they see something they think is a reflection. I mean, you know, the shot is a long-distance shot. We're looking through debris, and they said, see, see, look, you can see the reflection there. I said, I can't see crap in that photo. <laughs> it's actually amusing. And meanwhile, in the same video, a few feet away, steam was, you know, coming out. So, you know, it looked like it was finishing the dry-out phase of draining the spent fuel pool on four on unit four. Finishing the dry-out phase of draining the spent fuel pool on four on unit four. So there's a reality right there. It's giving you a pretty close estimate of what's really happened. There's, if there's any water left in there, it's not much. It's not a partial, you know, it's, all, it's down to the bottom. There's very little left in it. Male participant, I'm trying to figure out, how does NARAC fit into the monitoring picture? Isn't NARAC the ones that do the inaudible? Male participant, inaudible. Male participant. So they're all part of DOE, Department of Energy. Is NARAC part of DOE? Male participant, it's part of inaudible. Male participant, yeah, yeah, they're part of DOE. They're part of Department of Energy. So NARAC is, is a subset of the Department of Energy. Male participant, okay. They are the part of DOE that also has the, another male participant. So Fermac doesn't have the inaudible male participant. Well, that's, Fermac is also part of that team. Male participant, okay. NARAC is the umbrella organization. Fermac is a subset of NARAC. Male participant, I think Fermac is the inaudible male participant. NARAC is a subset. Another male participant. I'm guessing. I don't want to inaudible. Yeah, they're all related to each other under GM60, I think. No, no. NA60, the DOE group. Guy says, okay. So you can even see, look, we got so many agencies and so many acronym named groups. It's just the point, point people can't even figure out who is who anymore. I mean, this is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. We need one group to, to handle it maybe with a backup group, and we need proper modeling software, if you look at these guys like, well, it only goes out to a thousand miles. Well, are you telling me all this time with your knowledge of three mile in Chernobyl and what have you, you're only modeling to a thousand miles? You don't go beyond that? That's crazy because the Norwegian the NILU uh, modeling was clearly was global. I mean, you could they could give you a, oh, it was really, I cap, screen captured before they went down. And credit to Dutch Sense who was in there early. This was a guy that got me involved on YouTube, and I, I watched him go into the Norwegian thing. I jumped in there, too, and I was able to screen capture a bunch of graphs and charts and, and models and everything. So I've got some, I still have some evidence of that, even though it wasn't long after that that the site mysteriously went down. They said, we're not modeling that anymore. They went back to, like, SO4, sulfuric acid, and black carbon, and whatever else they were modeling at the time which is a whole problem in and of itself if you look at everything else that's in the atmosphere floating around other than the radioactive stuff. Oh, wow. Okay, so we're, we're learning, and, and I'll put in definitions and research some of this in greater detail to maybe give you better detail, but we know NARAC does modeling of the plume, and they're underneath DOE. And there's plenty of reference here when NARAC gives them the model. They say, wow, that's conservative, and that's NRC. And look, NRC I'm not a big fan of. Really, I'm not. Some of the guys in there are good. Most of them are just going with the flow, right? But it's so bad at DOE when they send a the plume model down. Even NRC is like, come on, that's really conservative. But they say, well, it's worst case. And the one guy says, no, that's not worst case at all because you're only taking so much of this and so much of that. And he's pointing out the flaws in it, you know. So that's the interesting thing about these documents. You really get to see inside this industry that it's been so hidden. It's like occult knowledge. It's not 
not advertised at all. Okay, let me go to the next one. This is on Unit 2. Male participants, I'm looking through my notes right now. My reaction from what we have heard is that they say that the primary containment is intact from what we have heard at Unit 2. However, with that said, I know, you know, at least some people on the team, there's a loud boom, there's a loud explosion, there's this loud sound in the vicinity of the suppression pool for Unit 2 a day or two ago. Another male participant, yeah, male participant. So there are some people that do believe that they lost the primary containment on Unit 2 back then. I have to go exactly through my notes. Mr. Castro, yeah, I remember that. You know, who knows? I mean, you know, there's no way to get in that building and know what male participant, yeah, Mr. Castro, the condition is of male participant, right. In Unit 2, we now know, yes, yeah, there's the melt and the containment was breached and Early on, no one can really get in there. The shine, they like to call it shine, is too intense. You have to fly over with a drone, fly with a helicopter, and, and get the radiation levels down before people can go in and be, begin to try to affect repairs or just stabilize it. First, you're really just doing your best to stabilize and keep the situation from getting worse and, and damage mitigation to the amount of radiation that's going to be released. And as far as Japan, well, they're, they're in a bit of a quandary. I was watching rooftop readings from some medical building and microsieverts today. And, you know, so there is definitely, it wasn't a lot. I do my calculations and add up to it much. But, you know, it's a steady over time. And then when you look at the low doses over time, you really got to worry about that too. Okay, on to the next one. Uh, let's see, this may be Castro. Oh, gosh, I didn't get the name on this one. Yep. We'll call it male participant for now. And so our dilemma here is, although I think it's Castro, or so our dilemma here is the challenge that we have is to try to keep the spent fuel pools in a coolable geometry, but yet reduce dose to the workers. Now, whether that's the Humvees, you know, or some other mobile, or build a shield, build a building, or some kind of shield out there that you can work behind, to install the equipment or dump lead on the top of the refuel floor, whatever you've got to do to drop dose so that they're just not willing to, and then there's some redaction. He says, now that they're, now what they're doing is they have bulldozers. I mean, the dose sounds like not as much a shine from the building as when the building blew up. There's been a fuel and pellets and whatever all over the place around the plant. So they're taking the bulldozers through and pushing the rubble and piles and they're saying that's cutting the dose down, you know, 60, 70 percent. So they're trying to, in these areas where the piping runs would go, they're trying to clean it up. But, I mean, the dose is still going to be, you know, incredible. I mean, they were talking yesterday. They said the resources they have were somewhere between two to 300 people. And that, you know, TEPCO and other licensees, the Civil Defense Force and some, some police. Now, participants. Are they going up to 25 rem? Do you know? Male participant. They've extended that, I think. Mr. Castro, no idea. Male participant. I don't know. They asked us how we deal with extending dose, and we just told them for emergency and a condition like this, we have guidelines that let us go to a certain limit. But in this case, you need to do what you need, need to do to get it done. Another male participant. We saw some media reports yesterday that said that they were they had authorized going to 25 rem. Another male participant. Yeah, obviously they need more, and they need more people to spread that around so that people aren't getting in excess of 25 rem. Male participant. Chuck and John, what was the basis, John, for your statement at that you believe there are spent fuel pellets on the ground of the property? John, because they gave us the dose rates of what 20 to 30 rem per hour. And they said, you know, the dose rates go down 70% when they bulldoze. Another male participant, debris, he says. Let me back up real quick to these. This is interesting when you look, are they going to 25 rounds? What they're discussing is the Japanese, and eventually they get to one point where they say, there, he says, you've got to do what you have to do. And they advise them, they're asking them, what do you guys do when you reach your limits? And, and he's telling them, well, hey, you may have to go beyond that. Look at Chernobyl and be you know, the heroes that flew those flights over in helicopters to drop the lead. And 
you know, so it's very difficult. People are going to be sick. People are going to die trying to go in and stabilize. And, and I'm sure the, the toll now in Japan, I don't know what it is, but I'm sure related to workers who have been sick and probably got radiation sickness, that's a good question. How many are now in the hospital? So 25 rem is already five times what they allowed a nuclear facility for an employee. Unless you're a pregnant woman, that would be 0.5 rem, and they're, they're going to exceed that. And there's plenty of statements in there where NRC guys are saying they're not willing to go down in there themselves. They're willing to tell them what to do and kind of help them out with advice or whatever, but clearly you can see at least some of them say that they don't want to go in there and others don't want to go in there. So it's clear that the levels of radiation are intense enough. People are avoiding you know, going in within a close proximity. John, debris out of the way. Well, you don't get 20 rem from contamination on the side of the spent fuel pool. It's got to be fission product. I mean, you know, you have, so how did the explosion occur? The spent fuel pool had to be at least 20%, 10% level, whatever. You had a significant zerk oxide reaction, all of these, all this hydrogen in a massive explosion. And what's right below the explosion? There's no body of water. You just got all of that spent fuel pool that's, you know, 2,000 degrees plus just baking there. I mean, you know, how can you think you'd blow apart, you know, girders and seals and everything else? And these little delicate spent fuel bundles that are 2,000 plus degrees are going to stay intact? I mean, that doesn't make sense. You blow out concrete walls and beams and the structure of the building is blown up. You've seen images. John, well, they say it's to, to clear the debris so they can get the fire trucks, the riot trucks, the water trucks, etc. I think it's some of it is debris but I think it's to significantly move the dose out of the way. Male participant, right. John, move the fission products, move the pellets, move whatever. Male participant. So this goes back to what you said earlier about their strategies right now being the helicopters and the water cannon. Mr. Castor, that's it. John, but they're using the bulldozers, or at least that's what they told us yesterday. Mr. Castro, yeah, that gets them the water cannons in there. Oh, I've got a mixed order here, but it's close enough. So anyway, yeah, yeah, I mean, male participant. No, I've seen those images. I mean, I guess I was just asking. That's more your logic than something that you've been told by anybody else. John, they haven't said it's fission products or pellets in the parking lot, but, I mean, it's got to be. Male participant. The purpose of the bulldozing is that, I don't understand, is that just to reduce the radiation, or are they, I kind of got that reverse order there, but you see in this series just the seriousness of it all would be, the bulldozers cleaning the pellets out of the way. And the one guy's given a he's given you a hardcore breakdown there. I mean, I don't know who this John character is here, but he's given you a pretty realistic assessment of the situation and what happens. The standard they they've already gone through there's a NUREG, N U R E G, it's some kind of nuclear regulation, it's some kind of manual that talks about my understanding is it talks about what happens in the meltdown of a particular reactor types, like in the Mark One containment. I've got an article posted up where Chuck Castro says they, according to NERREG, they always melt in a station blackout. They always have a criticality of station blackout. So clearly you can see these Mark I containments are, are problematic, but the, 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 uh, the NERREG is some kind of manual that gives some information. Well, this guy's kind of probably, my point being, is, is maybe pulling out of that NERREG. I, as soon as I get my hands on that, I want to read that thoroughly. But it seems like he's giving uh, some kind of textbook assessment of what would happen in that situation. And it, it's, not, it's not good, it's not pretty at all. He says it's got to be fish and product. Uh, spent fuel, at least 20%, 10% level of water before you can have that zerk oxide reaction. That's the zerk cladding on the spent fuel rods. Once it's not cooled, that has a reaction and bursts into flame. And my understanding of zerk fire, you can't just pour water. It would probably be bad to pour water on it. You have to put it out by another means. And it's a self, uh, what's the self-oxygenating fire. So, <laughs> I mean, wow. Solar panels and solar power is just so beautiful. So beautiful, especially if they release the restrictions for 20% efficiency on the solar cell, solar panels. I mean, that's what's going on, why Solyndra failed. Obama knew that when he put $500 million into Solyndra. He knows they're restricting solar technology. Try to get a solar recharger for your laptop. Look around at 20% efficiency. That's the best I could find. So that rings true with my 
research into technology suppression. So this little uh, page right here, page 81, it really is very telling. No body of water, 2,000 degrees just baking there. And he's just keeping it realistic, and it, it's hard to get that in mainstream and a lot of alternative media is going. They're giving you Fukushima light, and they're giving you FOIA document light if they're giving you FOIA documents at all. And this is major stuff here. When you just the description, the words, the way they describe the situation, this was downplayed. You never heard this on mainstream for sure, for sure. They don't want you to know this. And I know we don't have like a, and I know of a Daiichi with a six facilities in one, but we have them all over the place. If you look at South Carolina, man, it's like someone took a shotgun blast and wow, and then all these little spots all over. Well, that's South Carolina. They got nuclear plants everywhere. So while we might not have one facility by the beach with six reactors, we have six different facilities not far from the coast, and that, you know, with Sandy proved beyond any doubt we got a major problem. Okay. Pumping strategy, page 85. Mr. Castro, you know, comparisons, whatever, we can devise a better strategy. The pumping strategy may not be useful at all if there is no spent fuel pool. And there's just a rubble bed in there somewhere. Then what have you got? There's nothing to pump. So evidence here again that they spent a fuel pool, there might not really even be, there may be damaged and broken and cracked. There's nothing. You can't pour water into a pool if the pool itself is cracked and damaged or has major structural integrity problems, if I can phrase it that way. So all of, all of these repairs and water cannons, that's taken into consideration that you're able to, to fill a pool with water or that the, the main containment, it hasn't melted down in a China syndrome and gone down into the bedrock and, you know, then the water's leaking into the aquifer and you can't, you know, you have major problems, major problems. This they, they don't want to reveal. Not only just the cover-up about the plume, and we all got dosed by that, and now people we know are getting sick with leukemia and people are having cancer. This is what I'm hearing anyway. And as soon as I can document and get statistics to prove there's an increase in cancer, I'll certainly let you know. Again, I believe those, that research and that kind of statistics are being suppressed right now. They don't want anyone to know. Try looking for it yourself, and if you get a good lead on a study done in 2011 that shows cancer rates as compared to 2010, I definitely I want to see it. I need to see it. Okay, page 85. I read that, sorry. Page 91. Male participant. John, the first 40 rem numbers we saw were well before the explosion in Unit 4. And the supposition at the time was that this was, was shine from green pools. Another male participant. And it's, okay, yeah, but when they tell you the dose decreases 70% when they bulldoze the crap out of the way, but male participant, well, another male participant. Well, there could be some gross deposition to the west of the plant. There was a plume that migrated that way over the past two days. So there could be some gross deposition. Male participant. Deposition, but you're talking between two units. Male participant, yeah. Male participant, aren't you? Male participant. That deposition is a little bit downwind. Question mark. That deposition is a little bit downwind? Male participant. No, that probably... That's probably a contribution of ground shine between the two units. Mr. Hesta. Yeah, I don't know. We've got between 30 and 40 rem between the buildings. 30 rem between units 2 and 3. 40 rem between units 3 and 4. We've got what appears to be a 10 rem per hour line along the roadway that is just west of the unit, I'm guessing. We have Mr. Castro. Okay, so... 32, I mean, in a sense, it goes back to John's argument. This stuff is spread everywhere. Mr. Heston, yeah, I mean, that's not from contaminated steel inside. Male participant, well, it could be. Male participant, this could be reinforcement. Another male participant. Remember, that was a plume that, so mentioning of a plume and mentioning of some serious shine between the buildings, 40 rim, I'm pretty sure it's per hour, right? 40 rim per hour. It would, you wouldn't even be there an hour. You would have five times exceeded your, you know, think about that. And this is the problem. This is a problem at Chernobyl as well. You had to, to, to send people in, pull them back out, send more people in, and you were cycling them through, and you're trying not to, 
to put them in too many times. If you have to, you got to do what you got to do, as the guy says, even if you're sacrificing lives. This is the horrible thing. If a, if my solar panel is a branch hits it in a storm, hey, no problem. I just wait and go out and make repairs, clean up the glass, and just 80% efficient. Man, we're doing well. we really got to change up our energy, form of energy we're using. As nuclear, it's, wow. Okay, page 92. Male participants. So in terms, so not to play devil's advocate here, but you had a pool that was probably fully drained, fueled at several thousand degrees, a massive explosion, and we think nothing is happening to the rods or the pellets in that explosion? Male participant. No, we aren't saying that, but it's just where it is. You can get dose outside from deposition. You can get dose outside from shine or contribution. Another male participant, right? Male participant, of both, you could get dose outside from spreading material, whether it's fuel pellets or other stuff, and you can get male participant. I also remember that there's other stuff stored in the spent fuel pool. Male participant, right. Okay, moving to the next one, male participant. You know, and along those grounds, one of the major requests that we have this morning at the Ministry of Defense is, you know, any and all that we have dose set with dose measurement, with video cameras, etc. They want to be able to roadmap the site and the buildings, etc., so they can come up with pathways for their employees to go to minimize dose. So I included that one because you see there, again, they're worried about doses, dosimetry, sending a robot in to get an idea of what's going on before they, they want to send employees in to minimize their, their, their pathways, to minimize dose. Where is the... And that's what I was just reading back to the, the previous section. We were worried about shine between this building, rims between this building. They want to know specifically in detail what spot is, is more hot than other spots. We can approach by this route. We can approach by another route. We can bring trucks in here. We need to bulldoze over here. You see how much of a mess it's an undertaking. It is a Herculean task, like cleaning the Augean stables to try to go in and, and put like putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, basically, right? I'm going to take it to nursery rhyme type Aesop's fables if I have to, to get my point across. Okay, page 107, male participant. Yeah, they're making flights available to the other people who just want to call in and sign up. I mean, it's incredible. You can actually see people, particularly embassy people, right outside the embassy here, there is the sidewalks are full of people with suitcases. Male participant, right. Male participant, you know, they're getting the hell out of here, to be frank about it. Well, this shows you the people, you know, there's people with inside information. They certainly know when to get out of town. Just like Obama went to South America during the week that the plume hit and the worst of the fallout. I'm not a coincidence theorist, right? I'm really, I'm not. Him and his family, those retainers took off and went down to South America where nobody wants them. Nobody wants them down there. So put two and two together. You can figure it out. But in Japan, you can see people are lining up and get on a plane and get out of there because they know it's a catastrophic multi-unit meltdown. And it really, to be honest with you, you don't need three to melt down to have serious problems. It will only take one unit over here if there's enough spent fuel pool. If you look at the Robert Alvarez study, if we have a problem with spent fuel pools over here, it can be just as bad. So you don't, it doesn't have to be as bad as Fukushima. Chernobyl was less. Three Mile was less. The Simi Valley may have been less, but again, all of them are bad, and people were going to, the little guy suffers, is my point being. The general public who pays for it through the nose, not just in cash with their taxes, but with the cancer and the, you know, one thing that Radchick said the other night, there's other fallout in the, the fallout of people who are going to get sick and die from this, and we're going to lose people that we know and love. So this is why we all got to get involved. People need to dig into these documents, start writing about them, posting about them, and help us out here. Okay, let's see. DOE, big player in Three Mile Chernobyl, my note says. Mr. Castro, but nevertheless, you know, sooner or later somebody is going to have to do something. And DOE, I'm sure, will have a big piece of whatever it is that's done after the initial response is over with. They're going to have, they're going to be a big player in that, like, you know, Three Mile Island or so, or Chernobyl. So they will have a big role to play. Mr. Virgilio, right, right. And then we also reminded INPO, they're going to see if they could get you better access to data through WANO and TEPCO. That's the World Association of Nuclear Operators, if I'm correct. And 
it's interesting in here the way that's phrased. Again, they know they're being recorded. They, they mention that in the document. This is not a drill. Send everything to the Freedom of Information LIA 07 Hawk uh, department where they're going to screen for the Freedom of Information and redact and do all that. So they, they're careful with their language, but you can look in here and, and kind of pick through and see that what I get out of it is DOE is really, they're, they're overseeing for a large part these, these cover-ups or suppression of, of the, the severity is, is a nice way to say it. They're, they're overseeing the suppression of the severity. I mean, it's their industry that's at stake, right? If the Housewives of America really knew, if, if every day on The View someone came out and said what I'm saying, in short order these plants would be shut down when they realize just how dangerous it is to the children whose cells are dividing at a higher rate. So I want them to know that it seems to be like DOE, as we know in Three Mile Island, my, one of my early articles, I think it was titled Nuclear Madness. It's on my WordPress blog site. It's a great article that gives you a whole summation of nuclear power and everything. Well, in Three Mile Island, the DOE claimed there was no emissions, no, not of any significant level, just like they recently did with Oyster. This is a standard part of the course. No, nothing bad happened. Not much came out. Nothing to worry about. No big deal. Well, there was a settlement by the Three Mile Island Power Company to a family with a Down syndrome child of one point something million dollars, over a million dollar settlement which to me is pretty much an admission. Why would you pay out and settle if that wasn't the case? You know, So we look back, and, and there's more to it than that, but that's one small facet of a gem of people who were affected by Three Mile Island. Meanwhile, Department of Energy is, is downplaying the whole deal. And you know, interestingly enough, on a side note for the conspiracy science buffs, my research led me to find that, I don't know the name offhand, but the the gentlemen, for lack of a better word, who oversaw the PR, the press, and the downplaying of Three Mile, coincidentally was so involved in the overseeing during Bush's reign right after 9-11, he was kind of wrangling all the press and overseeing the press releases after 9-11. So make that what you will, but it's interesting how these people are involved all over the place. And if you really dig around, you see, like I say, how deep and wide the tentacles actually stretch. Okay, so it's conference call initiated. This one I included because there's a reference not only to California but to Portland as well. And I hadn't seen a reference to Portland. I've seen Cali and California doses, but nothing to Portland. Male participant, you had asked about data for Chernobyl on the contamination in the, we looked at this and this and the inaudible. This is very misleading because this is not based on exposure. This is based on deposition and uptake. Male participant, yes. Okay, so again, this is misleading. It's some of the, you see in here clearly some people are complaining this is not the right information. This is, uh, I need a more pessimistic run. These are really, really conservative. Hey, that's not a, that's not a worst case scenario. You missed this, this, and this. You see how this works? Okay, I also wanted to, uh, something I want to point out about the, oh, Chernobyl, right. During Chernobyl, and I need to go back to the costs and consequences of the catastrophe, the Yablokov and Nestorinko study, and look, because in there they, they mentioned that Oregon had rainwater warnings, and another state, Michigan or somewhere else, this is back in 86, right, in the mid-80s, there were rainwater warnings during Chernobyl. Okay, that's not, it's not like the United States has not, states have not issued rainwater warnings. But it's hard to issue that when the NRC and DOE is less than forthright with the congressmen and our representatives, and they're less than forthright with the state. They say, this is what we're going to give to the state, give them this press release or send them to this press release or whatever. Well, you see in the documents, there's a big difference between the press release, the talking points, and then what they're saying behind the scenes, even with all the redaction and the inaudible stuff at the most convenient times, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so back to the thing that says that you asked about data from Chernobyl on the contamination. We looked at this and this and the inaudible. This is very misleading because this is not based on exposure. This is based on deposition uptake. Male participant, yes. Male participant, inaudible. Male participant, well, same thing. Here is your deposition level of inaudible. Now, if you want us to go through the trouble of multiple inaudible speakers, male participant, yeah, I mean, it just shows you that the iodine and inaudible, the name, Another male participant. Oh, this is just showing the standards. Multiple inaudible speakers. Male participant. I wouldn't do them all, but 
male participant. Yeah, just maybe one in California and inaudible. Multiple inaudible speakers. Male participant. Here we go. Portland. Multiple inaudible speakers. Male participant. You've got to figure Haiti is possibly inaudible because they have nothing to work with. So even mention of Haiti as far away as Haiti. These guys, I, I tell you folks, when you, when you st study nuclear power and familiarize yourself with the fundamentals and, and research historically the, the previous accidents, you know right off the bat all these guys know that there's deposition released into particles released into the atmosphere. And they're carried around the world. And I was listening to Radchik quoting some Japanese scientists that show that the plume that was released, the initial plume, still travels the world ever so many 30, 40, 50 days, whatever it is, this mass of stuff is still, you know, it'll dissipate more and more over time. It's simple physics, but it's still concentrated to a certain degree. And we still have emanations. They have yet to entomb any of these, and nor do I, do I have I heard of any plans to that effect. So there's no uh, near end in sight, although I'm certain the emanations may be a, a less level of radiation by now is just constantly pouring a low dose out. I read a uh, mark the other day about krypton that's being released from all the nuclear plants and it's building up in the atmosphere. So it's a really serious situation, folks. Page 138. Dan, they're still about the same in terms of in the 10 to 40 rem per hour range around some of the reactor buildings. Brian, did we get the word that they are still pumping seawater to the reactors? Dan, as far as we know, they're still pumping seawater to the reactors, and those seem to be stable. We've got some indications that each of the three reactors is the vessel, the very low pressure, with about half the fuel uncovered in all three, and no, no pressure is indicated to the suppression pool. Okay, again, we're looking at they're given some dose range around the reactor buildings is why I include this one. It's a little about pumping seawater and whatnot. Again, not the, the best solution, seawater, because of the salt, the sodium chloride, and as mentioned in the documents of what that what is that going to do when that cakes up? What kind of reactions are going to go on with the salt water and everything? And there's barges being sent over the fresh water, but then they're just can we get them into the bay after the damage and so it's just a major mess. There's no easy fix. No easy fix at all. Clearly in the documents, you see that their, their little pretend version of nuclear power, well, I admit when there's no meltdown, it may seem safe, but you've still got your effluence. That's a radioactive discharge. It, and we, we know now that we can't rely on their information as being truthful and accurate when they do measure radiation. So when you look at the plants giving their normal, they're allowed a certain amount of discharge per year or whatever it is, you then begin to have to question, say, look, how come every time there's a discharge, it's always super low or not existent or below parameters? That is just an amazing, you know, what is the odds of this? Has there ever been a release they admit to and come out and say, hey, we had a really bad release, you know? So I don't think so. I've never heard of it. I'd like to know instead what you get the exact opposite. And clearly in these documents it shows it. They do everything they can to keep us from finding out. This has really got to be tweaking them that people are digging into these FOIA documents now and exposing some of like what Chuck Castor said during the station blackout that according to NureG, you're going to have a criticality. You know, people, They don't want people to hear that. That's pretty darn scary, especially if you live near one. Brian, good morning, Marty. Mr. Virgilio, the one thing about that is that we continue to hear from Chuck that the Chinese, that the Japanese don't have much of an appetite for that approach, that they still believe that the water cannon and the helicopter dumping buckets of water on top of the units is the better strategy. And, you know, we are assuming that they don't want to accept the dose that comes with hooking up this pumping equipment. Brian, oh, Mr. Virgilio. So although the pumps are on site in Bechtel in combination with our reactor safety team, RST, has sort of sketched out, you know, how one would hook up the pumps to get the head necessary to provide water to the spent fuel pools. We're not getting any takers from the Japanese side of this equation. So it's so hot, no one really wants to hook up pumps besides the Bechtel pumps. My understanding didn't work anyway. The fittings were wrong. They, 
they kind of, kind of in disaster capitalism showed up all of a sudden. Here's the pumps, you know, and the pumps aren't really right. And the Japs were first uh, skeptical of them and didn't really want to buy it. But in the end, they took them, and, and I forget how much they paid for them. But I don't, to my knowledge, they never, they never used them. And the fittings were wrong, or there's some problem with them. It could be a mistake on that. Maybe they eventually did, but right off the bat, they didn't do them any good. Okay, here's a really good one from the. Okay, exactly. This is I used this one in my articles early on, and I, I've titled this one "Dough." Dough, like Homer Simpson would say when he drops his little glowing thing of uh, fuel rod out of his pocket and enter to the Simpsons. Brian says, "Got it. Just kind inaudible. Add to the inaudible the wind shift. Is that still in the forecast?" Male participant, right? Brian, did we ever get the? I'm trying to think of what the best term is. The everything, everything, inaudible scenario back from, I thought that was one we were going to ask NARAC to run once they had time. Male participant, are you talking about the doses they saw all the way out in California? Add your dough in right there. Dough! Because the first guy's like, he knows these, this is my assessment anyway. I mean, it could be wrong, but they know they're being recorded during this, and they know about the freedom of information. They're very careful not to to use certain terms, plutonium is an outlaw term. You don't say mox. You don't say plutonium. I have to assume so because there's a total void of those words in here. I mean, you just don't see it. I haven't yet to, I've found plutonium once and mox, but that was an assessment from TEPCO. That wasn't even from us. So, so did we ever get the, I'm trying to think of what the best term is, the everything, everything scenario back from, I thought that was the one we were going to ask Narek to run if they had time. He don't want to come out and, and be specific about that it's the doses out in California. The next guy who's not, you know, keyed into what's really happening. Are you talking about the doses they saw all the way out in California? You know, so, and then Brian's like, yes, you know, uh, I can't hear the tape. Maybe my voice inflection and the, you know, it's not the same, but you can clearly see in a lot of these, it's not just one. There's many cases like this where they're, let's take the phone offline, call me later. You know, this is politically sensitive. Let's take it offline. A lot of, a number of times they use the word politically sensitive or of a politically sensitive nature. Well, what's politically sensitive? Well, the nuclear power industry is a doomed failure. Of it. It's gonna, it will be our, all of ours do if we do not begin to systematically decommission. It'll create jobs. We'll release suppressed technology and have solar panels that are 80 percent efficient. My dad's super battery patent. He can, someone can put into production instead of you know, turning all of his proposals down when these scientists have an invention. And no, they don't want it. Or they use you for press conference and then turn you away. That's a fact. This is a historical fact. So the dose out in California, they're trying to keep the lid on that. You know, he goes on to talk about Sandia. They do some modeling, too, um, and modifying the codes. There's a lot of modification of codes. I don't know if it's purposely to get a different result or if something so far off in some cases they say, hey, that can't be right, it's a thousand times less, you know. So there's a lot of confusion and not a lot of accurate stuff, and there's no clear attack and transparency at all. We really should have had some warnings over here. Okay. This is from page 145. Male participant. Had to modify the MAC code. They, NARAC, did... Narek did do their evaluation of using our source term, and they, they were calculating doses, particularly for children, thyroid doses of an audible after that the one-year dose, assuming some very conservative assumptions about ingestion and practices. So we had the group, the PMT, that's the Protective Measures Team, look at some of the actual data from deposits from Chernobyl which we had from DITRA. Now, DITRA is under DOE. Again, DOE, they know everything. They know everything I know. I know they know everything I know, right? And they know a whole lot more than what I know. Brian, right. Mr. Participant, historical data. And convert those to doses using the same update techniques. And they have some calculations. They hadn't shown them to be inaudible. But they are showing millirem range doses, like 1 to 10 millirem. Important here is to note Chernobyl. Again, reference to Chernobyl, deposit from Chernobyl. Historically, we know we had rainwater warnings from Chernobyl. Again, though, although they admit we're modeling off Chernobyl, and this is not just a one uh, a criticality or one source term. Chernobyl may have been two, may have spent fuel there as well, but this is multiples, multiples, and it's very bad right off the start. They can't even get in there. So, you know, folks, I hope you're starting to see with some of these 
radio broadcast I'm doing this that just the the severity of the situation when this happens, the cover up, the downplay, it's it's really all there. It's just so so revealing and so exposing of this industry that's managed for many years, but now this is third time's a charm, right? Fukushima, it's all gonna hang out in time and it will all come out especially through these for you documents. Okay, from page one Page 145, male participant, for the actual deposits. So we think there is some extreme conservatism in the DITRA numbers, and we will know more once reach is there and audible. So here's evidence conservatism in the DITRA numbers. So NRC even saying, look, DOE is sending the stuff, and it's very conservative. And even NRC is maybe wanting to get a little more realistic projection of what's going on. So we think there's some extreme conservatism in the DITRA numbers. And we will know more once research does there in Audible. Brian, okay. Male participant in Audible. Male participant. I got that. He wants to work on the last version in Audible. Or is there a fresher version? Multiple Audible speakers. Male participant. Are you taking it down? Male participant. Rebecca is going to take it down. Another male participant. Yes, multiple Audible speakers. So that should be part of the data. Again, um, this one was important just because it's showing the you know more information on DITRA. I've got a file that's just for DITRA and NARAC and that kind of stuff, so we can get a better idea of what's really going on in particular, and, and focusing on those groups that do this modeling because we want to get a picture of what's going on with their modeling, who's modeling, when they're modeling, what the models look like, and and then once you see the plume models that are in the documents and the and other things like that. You, you know, references to plume, and they're modeling the plume, but FEMA's on stand down. <clears throat> I ought to read you that David Liu letter. And that's pretty amazing when they say they're plotting the plume and watching the plume, but FEMA's on stand down. You know, there's such thing as a false flag, but the other thing they teach at the Chicago school is the stand down. If you can go there to and, and learn economics at Chicago school, which is a total farce, or you can go there at the college in Chicago, or you can go there and you can you can learn false flag or stand down operations. That's a fact. That's what I've heard anyway. So stand down is really simple. Just asking someone not to do something. You just you don't as opposed to causing a false flag. You just hey, don't react to this. You know, like Dick Cheney, don't scramble an F-16 to take down the commercial aircraft or whatever. It's a good example of that. So let me. It's kind of like we just tell them stand down, don't talk about it. It's essentially it's a big giant stand down on the information flow. Is my point being coming out of Fukushima, coming from the federal government, from the quote unquote federal family, as they're referred to throughout these documents. And it does sound like an exclusive family to me because they they don't trade information with us. They're sheeple like children. They really don't. They keep us in the dark. Okay, page 149, this is the DOE Wranglers. Again, you hear NRC talking smack about DOE because DOE, if they're just not, they're not given a realistic model. They know that they're, they're, they, these guys do cover-ups in the DOE. Historically, Three Mile is talking about in Chernobyl, the DOE running, running the show during those events, i.e., my, my analysis is that they're doing the cover-up and downplaying damage mitigation and the checking media and, and, and doing what they can there. So very telling and the, the NRC is worried about the DOE. So it says, male participant, try to follow this by email. Is there is not a, there is not a non-NRC name in uh, an audible, this thing, an audible. Male participant, well, okay, here's how that all transpired. I was on the phone with an audible asking him to come an audible. I was trying to get us access to WANO, World Association of Nuclear Operators. Male participant, yes. Male participant, in return, he said, you know, I'd really like to get somebody from our side involved in this. Male participant, yes. Another male participant. So we've been working that deal for the last 24 hours, 36 hours. Male participant. There's no preclusion of that, though, by second male participant. I'm not asking permission. I'm not asking permission. Male participant, that you need. Male participant, that's absolutely right. A male participant. And we ought to giving assistance. We ought to be giving to experts, not male participants. On the other side of this is DOE pushing to have a contingent of DOE people join Chuck. Chuck is saying, quote, I don't need that kind of help here just yet, end quote. 
So that's an issue that male participants, yes, because if he sends a contingent of DOE people, we're going to have to send a contingent of Wranglers to male participant. And Chuck knows that very well. So this is an issue that either Phil or Mike could have to deal with today with former Commissioner Lyons, Lyons and Audible. Maybe he wants to settle down, but not today. We don't need that kind of... I mean, so this is very telling and insightful into the DOE and the <clears throat> relationship between DOE, the dynamics between NRC and DOE. You know, maybe NRC is a little bit resentful that DOE comes in and, you know, maybe has the authority and, and not, I'm not saying push them around, but you can certainly see here they're, they say they have to wrangle them, you know. That means, what well, do you wrangle? That's you bring the cows in, they're straining, and they're wandering around, they're getting all over the place, hooked up in the fence, down on the briar, stuck in the water hole, you got to wrangle them in. Well, that's DOE. They're the lost cows of the nuclear industry, if you will. How's that? Okay. 50-mile evac, page 150. Male participant, right. The PMT wants to inaudible some insights to the press release from yesterday about the inaudible. Hey, Jim, for your benefit, is this the first time you've been here? Jim, I've been following it in Audible. Male participant, from an Audible. Jim, yes, an Audible. Male participant, all right. We put out a press release yesterday. The theme of the press release is the U.S. has recommended protective action, get out, protective action guidelines out to 50 miles. Jim, yeah, what I read was the U.S. is recommending for U.S. citizens to. Yes. Male participant says, yes. Jim, execute a 50-mile evacuation. Male participant, that's right. That's correct. There's a section redacted there, a nice block redaction. The male participant says, so with that press release, somebody made the decision that we attach some very highly technical data from Rascal. They do modeling. Rascal runs. And if you're smart enough and you look closely at the data, it appears to be very inconsistent because it shows we did two runs. We did one run with assuming a single cooler was inaudible the atmosphere. And then we did another run assuming two coolers and a spent fuel were released into the atmosphere. And it showed a single cooler as greater activity at the 10-mile point. Male participant. So we didn't, have, we didn't know why that was until we had to go back in and dissect the assumptions. So the reasons for that inconsistency are the following. Number one is that for a single cooler, it was assumed that it was at power and was an immediate release. With the two coolers and the spent fuel pool, the assumption was it was released two days after shutdown. The second factor is the meteorology. For the single unit release, it was a lower wind speed, and there were rainy conditions. So your particulates are falling out sooner at the 10-mile point. For the multi-unit, there was no rain and greater wind speed. So at the 10-mile point, you have this inconsistency. Then they catch up to each other at 50-mile point. Male participant, inaudible. Male participant, does that make sense? So important, what I wanted to include here, this goes on, but real quick, you, it, meteorology, the rain and the wind, and that's very important. That's where the fallout lands. If it's raining, that's where it's going to come down at. So you see how they're doing some of their assumptions for the modeling and things. Can You really need some competent people who are able to grasp the big picture and go, and, and you would be modeling for worst case, too. I don't understand why off the bat you didn't just say worst case, and then start modeling down for there. Knock off the source term each time and give me an array, and then let's keep an eye on the situation. And, and you know, obviously, though, there's no rainwater warnings or any kind of safety measures given here, even told not to take potassium iodine. And, and I really think now in particular areas in that first month, if ever anyone should have taken it, that would have been the time. If you were in certain states, and we'll go over mortality index studies by month, by week, and we'll look by state, and we'll look by age, and we'll see who is affected, what states were hit hardest when, and what type of, like, in, for instance, in California, I saw where around, it was older, 40 to 60 or something. It was this astronomical number of increased percentage, over 60% increase in the mortality index study. So in that particular spot in California, they got hit. It hit really hard, undeniable, you know. Male participant, there's some re redaction before this segment. Male participant, yes, yeah, so it was an audible. Male participant, well, the plots really only go to 50 miles. Male participant, yes. Male participant, rascal is only good 50 miles. Second male participant, but it shows, male participant, you can't get an audible at 50 miles. 
male participant, but we don't know what is what it is beyond that male participant. Do we have any follow on second male participant? Well, NARAC is going to an audible, but they apparently they got multiple and audible speakers, male participant. You know about Chernobyl. And if we were to have an audible where we are today and U.S. citizens in the Ukraine, what would we have told them? We've got the benefit of knowing everything there is to know about Chernobyl. How far out would we in audible? Would that be roughly consistent with the recommendation we would have made then? Male participant. We haven't looked at that aspect of it. We're looking at, we're actually looking at the deposition and audible function. Male participant. So that's what you are largely going to get here, right? Another male participant. Yes, male participant. Maybe a little less because with an operating reactor, we've already gone beyond the operating reactor stage. Realistically, we could go in an audible the spent fuel, okay? So it's got a, an audible age in it. Brian. Again, this is Brian. Male participant. Hey, Brian. Brian, good morning. Welcome back. Male participant. Good morning. Brian, one of the other scenarios that was run but was not included with the press release was Unit 4 spent fuel in audible with an audible melting? Male participant, yes. And that also took you to the 50-mile tag. Male participant. In fact, that was the driver. That trumped these other ones. So they're talking about modeling the spent fuel on number four. And we also hear that spent fuel number four was almost no water. The Japanese say, I don't buy that crap. The Japanese say, we see a little reflection there, Castro. I don't buy that crap. Then they're saying, maybe the whole pool is distorted in the pools and there's fuel all over the place in the little... You know, we're going to have to begin to look at these documents and say, look, maybe even what we're getting now, we're going to need to go in and, and, and rewrite and redescribe what happened there according to what our guys were seeing on the ground at the time. Some of this is pretty realistic, and maybe we need to rewrite some of this history here where they're saying it's not as bad as it was. Clearly, it was a, a lot worse than they ever told us, much worse than they ever told us. One of the other scenarios that was run but was not included with the press release was Unit 4 spent fuel with an audible melting. Okay, so that was a, a much more serious model, and it was not included with the press release. And, and so they're downplaying everything. Clear evidence right there, clear evidence. Middle participant, yeah. Isn't there a problem, though, about having an audible that says you are exceeding EPA tags outside an audible? That's a problem. Male participant. Ah, so, hey, let me tell you right now, quick, let me quote Captain Jack Sparrow, folks, Captain Jack Sparrow. The problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude towards the problem. Okay, and that's what I would say to the NRC. That's what I would say to Obama and this administration, any administration that promotes nuclear power. You know, the problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude towards the problem of shutting these plants down and decommissioning them. Captain Jack Sparrow, folks. Okay, sorry about that. A little first there. Male participant. How so? Male participant. I don't think we said that. Male participant. It sounds 50 is an audible unless you put something in there that says when you now understand how the code works, what the underlying assumptions are with regard to meteorology and the amount of content that is actually likely to be released or has been or an audible. Or you can do an incremental an audible that says, well, we said an audible code and your understanding of the code and how it works. And when you an audible the actual conditions, this is a prudent step now as we start to preclude the need for further steps later or something like that. It sounds like lawyers trying to phrase something right there. Again, it's very, you know, it remind me of the BP spill. Who was the guy in the White House press at that time? Uh, gosh, can't think of it. Was it? It wasn't Tony Snow. So it came after him. Anyway, the discussion was over a slick or a sheen. Was the oil spill, was it a slick or was it a sheen? And for 15 minutes, they rasped the guy. He never, he said, well, it's varying in different thicknesses, and he, he, he wouldn't commit to anything. You know, I would just, you know, wow. And that's exactly what this is. They're just beating around the bush. They'll give you a press release, and they'll be vague and general about it and issue no warnings and downplay everything, right? And that's fascism in the nuclear industry. Because otherwise you kind of, you've got to finesse the inaudible that the runs show that you should be evacuating more than 50. You've got to explain why you're not, right? So if it says more than 50, you've got to explain why you're not going beyond 50. And, and what flew up the red flag was when uh, Jaxco calls for a 50 mile event. If it had just been 10 miles, people wouldn't have thought much of it. It wouldn't have been as big an uproar and suing of freedom of information on the level that it was. 
But when they knew he broke all the records and went to 50 miles, something really serious was going down. And on that alone, you begin to issue your warnings. It is 50 enough for evacuating at 50 miles. It's serious enough for evacuating at 50 miles. And we don't normally do this. That seems to me that that's reason enough to really give some serious rainwater warning, if, if nothing else, on the west coast of Memphis. That's a minimum, minimum. No participant. Well, our protective action recommendation was second male participant. Whatever the answer is, you need to explain it. Male participant. We're not inaudible to run. Laughter. Ha ha. Male participant. The basis for the protective action of 50 miles was the run we did that only looked at unit four and the inaudible. Male participant inaudible. Male participant. No, no. Male participant, I'll give you a perspective. I've got, I'll give you a perspective from a knowledgeable person who has been outside of the inner circle following this based on what we have and audible to ourselves, admitted to ourselves. Not necessarily public, but public too, but mostly what we've said to ourselves. And, you know, you can, you can just point at a few things that are obvious. From day one or two, especially after the first explosion, this seemed to be transitioning to a spent fuel situation. And we had to worry about analytics that an audible zirconium fire, which research says will happen. And NEI, National Energy Institute, says something different in their talking points. Imagine that. Male participant. But I think one of the unknown factors in that is what do do with fuel when they offload it? If they're doing a one by four like we have told our guys to do, then the research studies would say that the unit four pool was too old to And that's the end of that little clip right there. So pretty telling in there what we're talking about. This, I mean, you get plenty of evidence that, that there's two versions of information, what we're going to get talking points right here in this particular one. And the guy says something different in their talking points. And this guy is trying to give you perspective from a knowledgeable person who's been outside of the inner circle, and they've been talking amongst themselves, not necessarily public, he says, <clears throat> but most of what we've said to ourselves. And then he says, well, any ice thing is something different, and they're saying something different. They're talking points. So be very wary of any I. These are the ones that say the Tooth Fairy Project is bunk, you know, when it's pretty much a lot. You can't find anything to discredit it. It's a very rational, logical, methodical study. Page 163, male participant. That would be helpful, male participant. But something that might be even more useful is we all have these status updates that we have done. Male participant, I've been reading them. Second male participant, okay. Male participant, I will give you this comment too. When we first started, well, not long after we started, Sarah was sending out an update, and that was, I think she got like two or three of them off. And the next thing we transitioned to is an audible. We were filling out to see if an audible, right. Male participant, which was completely uninformative. So I sent back a note to her. A note to Sarah and said this, you know, we've got to continue to do these other things because you're an audible trying to track this, you know. That DHS table makes sense for an audible. It doesn't do an NRC internal audience any good. An audible, various places in an audible. One of the people I'm traveling with was an audible, John McCann, right, from Intergy. So he is tied into NEI. I mean, we're doing, we're with NRC saying, what's NEI an audible in terms of useful information? Now, I'm not saying it was not audible, just more of it. He is following, you know, his inaudible. We've got out blackberries out trying to figure out what the hell was going on. Male participant. Yeah, I think that was one of our early male participants. Back, though, to this other update, which male participant. That was a DHS, you know, template that we were trying to propose information into. Male participant, yeah. Male participant. It might be useful for them and male participant. My point is it doesn't serve an internal NRC audience. Male participant, yeah. Male participant at all. Male participant. We settled into that status update. I think we're going to keep it. Male participant. That's helpful. Probably should scrub it, though, to make sure there's no conflicting information in it. Because some of the stories get a quick read was an audible. Now, that's really blockbuster section right there. I mean, I'll, I'll read back through read back through it just to be sure we're clear on what they're saying because it's like they're, they're doubting NEI number one. Hey, that's not a good source of information, NEI. 
and they're saying they're talking about the VHS template for information. They're saying our information does not fit into their template. So their template for DHS allows for even less information. Right? You can only conclude that. You can only come to that conclusion. So NRC, while it has a larger set of information, if we try to input it into the DHS template, it may work for them, but it ain't working for us, right? And so keep this other thing we got going to the side, this other brief or whatever, which is going to have better information. So very telling to DHS. I mean, again, I tell you with FEMA and DHS, I would disband them immediately, immediately. I'd rather give a tax break to citizens and say, stock up on food and water and be your own FEMA and have a citizen's network and your militia will help you out with the sheriff. And to, We don't need these agencies that really, when you study these FOIA documents, what is their purpose? Well, I can only conclude to protect the fascist government, the industry, the corporate, and the state, the government. That's what they do. They're, they're there to run a, a damage control. They're there to receive flack and to take the heat off of them. And, and they have other purposes as well. I'll be going to that soon enough with my weaponized weather special. I'm still working on that. But, but this is very telling to DHS. You know, what are they doing there? They're not helping us. They don't care about security of the home. They, they, they were modeling the plume. They put FEMA to stand down. And we got blasted, folks. That's what Plume Gate's all about. And it happened on Obama's watch, and he got reelected. Such is the level of suppression in this country. It is amazing. And I tell you, the people making excuses for alternative media need to stop doing that. If they're not going to these documents, what I'm telling you here tonight is just that for me, and in my opinion anyway, it's, very, it's a re big revelation. It's a big eye-opener for those of us who are ignorant to nuclear power, and it's a lock. I mean, it's their own words. It's their own words, man. It's their own words. And in the end, he says, we probably should scrub it so we don't have conflicting information. You know, there's so much talk. We need to be in alignment with this group. We need to be in alignment with this group. We need to be in alignment with this group so that we have the same story. We're given the same story, the same lie. Okay, that's just being real. I'm just keeping it real. So all I can do is keep it real anymore. Nothing left for me but keeping it real. Page 169. Let's see, we're going to finish this tonight. I only go to 20, so we're getting closer uh, to the end of this. Male participant, Chairman, we now focus more on pool number three than pool number four. Dan, yes, a couple of the data points that I think you are waiting for we don't quite have yet. There's the aerial monitoring, aerial measurement system from DOE. They did do the flight. We got that initial data package within the last hour, but I think there was, I think that inaudible to get that data. The other piece, looking at the projections to California, research is working with Sandia. Sandia needs to modify the code because the code currently goes out to 1,000 miles. So we expect, we are hoping later today to get that worked out and get them to start getting some runs to support that. Well, folks, here's clear evidence right here that, that only goes to 1,000 miles. He says, hey, we've got to modify that. It's going to have to go beyond 1,000 miles. They know. They know the plume goes beyond 1,000 miles. They know from three miles. They know from Chernobyl. They admit it. They admit it. It's all admitted. You want to know why they're blowing up on Petraeus and his mistress or whatever right now? Hey, I'm reading to you why. They don't, they don't want this on TV. They're going to give you all these little high offs and nothing will come of it. Nothing will come of it. And it's all over TV, right? The guy that exposed it was also an FBI uh, for the FBI bomb plot. You know what I mean? And you research those bomb plots, you know all about them, right? So it's the same old story, folks, over, over repeating itself cyclically, right? They don't care about us. They know the plume's coming. Out to 1,000 miles, modify the code. You know, it's criminal. It's a felonious negligence. The holder should be pursuing this right now instead of talking about the Petraeus scandal or well, whatever he's prosecuting. I don't know. What do they call? Page 170, water cannons and hibernats. Male no participant. We saw some video footage that just was broadcast on Japanese TV. And about two hours ago, they allegedly were using the water cannons, but we didn't see actual shooting of the water. We just heard about it. Chairman Jack Scope, okay? Male no participant. And then there was a report that they backed away because of the high rad field. So that's not encouraging. Again, showing you know the attempts to try to contain things and just how little bit of effectiveness is actually brought to bear when you consider the situation. Jack's ghost. So right now, our concern, our primary concern, is the three, the two pools. Male participant. Yes, Chairman Jack's ghost. Do we know about any releases? Oh, I guess we're waiting on the air sampling. Male participant. Well, they're having continual releases because they are continuing to test. 
Chairman Jacks go, okay. Male participant, all right. Chairman Jacks go. But from the pools at this point, we don't know. Male participant, well, the indication from our team in Japan was they expected that there was high contamination caused by the explosions detected in the pool. And uh, remember, the information about bulldozing the debris field substantially reduced the dust rate. So their thought was that if you don't have fuel particles out there, at least you have substantial contamination of the surrounding ground. Jacks go, yeah. Again, very telling, fuel pellets, ground contamination. It's not a pretty scene. It's not going to be a pretty scene when we have a meltdown criticality over here. Three mile, we got off easy. Simi Valley reactor, maybe not so much. Maybe that one was worth, worse, and that's one to look into. There's a lot of suppression on that one. Okay, from page 177, we're almost done here. Chairman Jacksco. Okay, everybody. And just again, the 50 miles is based on what? What radiological scenario? Male participant. The 50 miles, when we were talking about it yesterday morning at this time, was based on the radiological scenario involving one spent fuel pool. Chairman Jacksco. Okay. Male participant. But we have comparable runs with loss of core from a reactor, right? Male participant. Yeah. Male participants. So both of those simulations that we attached in yesterday's press release suggest evacuation out to 50 miles of the approved protective action. JAXCO. Okay. So it's basically kind of both of the possibilities that could go wrong. Male participant, right. Now, it's not the additive effect of there are multiple core releases and multiple spent fuel pools. Chairman JAXCO, right. Male participant. I mean, we have those results. Chairman Jacksco, inaudible, fairly easy to derive. Male participant, right. Chairman Jacksco, add the plots together. Male participant, right. Chairman Jacksco, and it doesn't, you know, again, I mean, if there is no, you know, thermal dynamic effects of the multiple releases simultaneous, which would be highly unlikely. Male participant, right. Chairman Jacksco, I mean, effectively, you know, it that doesn't significantly change the recommendation at this point. And given that there is a voluntary departure at this point, it's to some and that's the end of that. Let me, let me remark right there where it says, uh, it doesn't significantly change the recommendation at this point. Even if it, so the minimum would be 50 miles. That's what they're kind of getting out here. They're, they're modeling and saying, look, the minimum is going to be 50 miles. Even if we model more source, source terms, it's not going to, it's not going to be less of a, a, a evacuation point. So the 50 miles, we're safe right now by saying 50 miles. They're not going to go beyond that. Because, man, I'm going to tell you what, that would raise a, a boy, people would freak out around the planet, no doubt about it. So 50 is kind of the limit you can go to without raising undue alarm. And at the same time, they know if they model more than just a spent fuel pool of one reactor, as this says, you know, this is either, this is, it's not the additive effect of multiple core and multiple spent fuels. This is either one, one spent fuel pool or one reactor as a source term, and then that will get you to 50 miles. That will get you to 50 miles, folks. I'm just keeping it real. And number three was Mox Fuel. That will get you to 50 miles, and thou shalt never enter that 50-mile zone ever again. People will die in, in, in putting a sarcophagi over the unit. That's just, just like Chernobyl, just like Chernobyl. And don't let them fool you. The animals are thriving at Chernobyl. No, the animals are not. They're, humans aren't hunting there, yes, but the animals still suffer effects. I've read all about it. That's a bit of... Uh, nuclear propaganda to make you think Chernobyl wasn't that bad. Animals are doing great around Chernobyl. No, they're not. No, they're not. The radiation is still there as elements break down. They turn to sea steam and iodine later on. So they're still getting plenty of dose stuff at Chernobyl. Nobody wants to live there. Nobody's ever going to live there. Okay, this is close to the last one. It's uh, titled Unit 3, Male Participant. The media, reporting, the media reporting shows the water drops occurring on Unit 3. Is that your understanding, Mr. Castro? Yes, that's their priority is Unit 3, male participant. And why, I guess when we came off this morning, John was on his way over to talk to NISA and TEPCO, and there, there was no water in Unit 4. And that was one that was on top of our list, and all, well, putting 3 on the top of their list. I think, why are they putting 3 on the top of their list? Well, that's the mock fuel and 3. Plutonium, the most deadliest substance known to man. Just smart, folks. Mr. Castro. The reason it would be the priority is because it, it was, now it's not steaming at all. It was a priority because it was steaming heavily. They knew they were losing water level in it. 
because it was steaming heavily. So they wanted to get to that one, and they believed through their helicopter flight and their vague, you know, nondescript images that there was water in Unit 4. And they just went, yeah, they believe there, they didn't say it's covered, but they believe there's a decent amount of water in Unit 4. The highest priority for them is Unit 3 right now. This was very telling, you know, that they're talking about Unit 3, Unit 3 with a mock fuel. Why is that one so bad? Well, do your study on mock fuel and get up to date on it because countries refuse to allow them to use it, but now there's a push in hand to bring it into the U.S. I think the Tennessee Valley story is going to use it in one of their reactors. And it uses up old stores of plutonium, is my understanding. Weapons grade plutonium they can use and you know, it doesn't use it 100%. There's still leftovers. There's still byproduct, right? That's what the NRC calls it, a byproduct. Not a waste product, but a byproduct. Okay, let me make sure. Bear with me just a moment. And 21. Okay, so I got this. Hold on. Okay. Okay, so the highest priority for them is Unit 3 right now. Mr. Castro, primary containment, male participant. I'm not sure if it really matters, to tell you the truth. I mean, the source term is, you know, orders of magnitude. Oh, this is a separate. This is about unit two. I'm, I don't want to make sure I'm right. I'm going from 54 to page 58 here, so this is another section. Uh, I'm not sure if it really matters, to tell you the truth. I mean, the source term is, you know, orders of magnitude with or without unit two. Male participant. Yeah, I mean, it. We want the status, no, but isn't. We want the status report to be correct. But in terms of consequences or whatever, I'm not sure if it really matters. Because, yeah, no, I agree. And this is about unit two. So, I mean, the source term is, you know, orders of magnitude with or without unit two. So uh, it's bad enough they're admitting here with or without unit two, boom, we got it serious. It's bad enough now. Add in order, you know, unit two, source term, orders of magnitude with or without unit two. So... When you have multiple criticalities, three or four source terms, maybe a spent fuel pool, hey, what the criticality less or criticality more. It's pretty darn serious at that point. Okay, last one, titled Drops Not Effective. And I tried to clip about these, their schemes and plans and whether it worked or didn't work, you know, because like I say, the Indiana Jones is to a certain degree and they're winging it because each plan is different and each situation is different. Male participant. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Castro. I think maybe I told you, I can't remember exactly what all I told you, but water drops don't seem to be effective. The dose rates were not altered at all. You probably already know that. Male participant. Yeah, we were watching them on TV, and I can't imagine they're not being very effective. So that's the last one, and that shows you that the water cannons weren't doing a whole lot. They're bulldozing stuff over days before they can get equipment in. They, they can run... A power, but then they have switch boxes and electrical outlets, and that's all damaged by water, damaged by explosion. Again, this is not just the cover-up of the plume and fallout, and, and people are sick now, and, and people got sick then, but you clearly see that in these disasters just how serious they are. And, and this, this was largely hidden in Three Mile, largely hidden in Chernobyl. You just don't get a real great description of what went down because there's been a cover-up. I mean, that's the whole thing about it. So... While Obama promised transparency and gave us a lot of lip service, we've had the most secretive administration ever since. According to my research, the number of doc documents made classified or top secret under Obama is an all-time high. So we've got quite the opposite, and, and don't expect the next president to reverse and go in an opposite direction unless more people are involved and, and continue to get involved. So I'm going to leave off of that here tonight, tomorrow, we'll look at or the day after we'll look at some of these mortality projections the Bobby one study is, is worthy of taking a closer look at very interesting and quite shocking at the same time as we are now finding people who are becoming sick with leukemia and other cancers and let's see if this grows and increases I'm looking for any information or links on cancer studies or statistical studies of cancer uh, before Fukushima, yes, but most importantly, the year following. The year before and the year following was what I would like to examine. 
Okay, I think that's going to cover it for tonight. I will be back in the next couple of days. We'll, we'll get back into this on the 40 documents, and I'm still working on an article on the weaponized weather that they're using on us and the history of hurricane modification and lawsuits pertaining to. I think you'll find it very enlightening. Okay, that's going to cover it for tonight. This is Patrick Penry. I appreciate everyone joining me and getting the word out. Thanks very much. Have a good night.